Welcome to episode 40 of the Business Development Podcast. And on today's milestone episode, we have marketing expert Esther Hall with us today. She's going to impart some really great wisdom. Stay tuned. The great Mark Cuban once said, business happens over years and years. Value is measured in the total upside of a business relationship, not by how much you squeezed out in any one deal. And we couldn't agree more. This is the Business Development Podcast, based in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and broadcasting to the world. You'll get expert business development advice, tips and experiences, and you'll hear interviews with business owners, CEOs, and business development reps. You'll get actionable advice on how to grow business. Brought to you by Capital Business Development. Capital Let's do it. Welcome to the Business Development Podcast. And now your expert host, Kelly Kennedy. Hello, good morning. Welcome to episode 40 of the Business Development Podcast. This is crazy. This is like a little key mark episode, actually. Episode 40, we've made it here. Today, I have an absolutely amazing marketing and business development guest, the first of, of our kind, Esther Hall. Esther has enjoyed a colorful and diverse career journey spanning from wine brand management to lifestyle, tires, mobility, and now landing in industrial operations and maintenance at Fleur Corporation, serving a variety of business development and marketing strategies through these companies. After studying in Chile and Prague, she obtained her MBA with a focus on international business and also completed a design thinking certification through MIT. As a ferociously hungry lifelong learner, she is currently studying through the International Society of Sustainability Professionals to first obtain her S followed by her S. Esther embraces humanistic connection as a core of her marketing philosophy with a fervent push to create content to delight and surprise the target audience. Esther, thank you so much for coming on the show. Kelly, I'm so jazzed to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And 40 episodes, congratulations. Thank you. That is quite an accomplishment. Yeah, I. so when I started, <laughs> you, you were there when I started this show. I like there. I remember kind of spitballing the idea of you when I was first <laughs> getting this going. For those who don't kind of know, Esther, Esther and me actually work together on occasion. She is my counterpart at Fluor US. I do some work right now for Fluor Driver, which is kind of the Canadian operations maintenance arm of Fluor. And so we've had meetings, we've had lots of conversations. And Esther, you really are a leader in marketing and business development. I always enjoy our conversations, which is why I wanted to have you on the show. I think you can provide so much value to my new entrepreneurs, my new people in business development. I think this is my first opportunity to really have a business development and marketing conversation. I, you know, most of the people I've interviewed have been entrepreneurs, business owners, or experts in different fields. But today, I have a fellow expert in business development, which I'm really excited for. Can you launch us off a little bit into your story? Us in business development, we all have a very unique story about how we found our way here. What is yours? Oh, we do. We do. I have a little bit of an outside the box story. Actually, I did things in kind of a reverse order, as it were. I actually started out my career in my early 20s and in the wine industry. And I was selling wine before I was even legally of age to do it. <laughs> and that is really what introduced me to the importance of brand power, because... When you have a wine portfolio, you've got like all these Cabernets, you've got all these like Chardonnays. And so how do you sell this Chardonnay over that Chardonnay, you know, with the competitors on the market? And then, of course, you know, you really discover storytelling and that emotional connection. And you have to get the people to like to really connect and understand the brand. And so that is what kickstarted my love and my passion for marketing all things marketing. And then in my late 20s, I finally was able to finish up my undergrad and then got right into the MBA where I got to study internationally and abroad, as you mentioned. And then while I was in that program, I had a like group project where we worked with some people from Michelin and we had a really good time working together and they were like, Hey, you know, you should totally come work for Michelin. We've got the Michelin guide. You've got this background in wine. It would be a great fit. And so I joined Michelin and I was with Michelin for the majority of my thirties. And that was really cool. Just getting the mobility, the experiences and to serve a portfolio with the, you know, just the sheer mass expansion that Michelin has. And then, as you mentioned, for the past two years, I came over to floor to be 
be the marketing manager for North America, which is also really fun because talk about a really dynamic brand and, you know, with that kind of power in the industry. So it's, it's been really fun. Marketing is super fun. And my obsession with it is because at the end of the day, marketing is just psychology, right? Like it's just, how do you influence people to choose to spend their money with you? And so it's a real fun, just like human psychology, human connection kind of, kind of exercise every day. So it's a lot of fun. I love business development. You know this. You know this about me. I, yeah, yeah. I really am doing the one thing, the one thing I didn't know that I was supposed to do, but I definitely am supposed to be doing it. <laughs> it's so funny. It's like when you look at all the things you wanted to do as a kid, business development was never on my radar. I always like to say that you don't choose business development. Business development chooses you. It just, it just finds you one day. It's like, this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. I hope you enjoy it. But it really is <laughs> one of the best things in any business. Like, I would argue yeah. that being in the business development and marketing side of a company is sometimes better than even running that company. It really is like the freedom to really express yourself, the freedom to kind of do it your way and to help build interest in a company in a brand. It is it's a ton of fun. And people don't recognize how fun. much fun it is unless they're doing it. I think one of the challenges that I definitely notice when I'm talking to new business owners, new entrepreneurs, or, or new business development people, is there's an idea now that in the 21st century, we don't have to make phone calls anymore. We don't have to physically reach out to people or do physical brochure drops or to build real human connection. Me and you both know that's just not true. You want to speak to that yeah. a little bit? Well, so you can't avoid like, digitization is out there, right? But one of the things that I find most interesting that's a new trend right now, and you guys could go look it up, it's super interesting, is the decline in dating apps because people, the, the Gen Zs, God bless them, I love them because they are totally transforming just the overall marketplace right now. But they're like, you know, we, we need, we're craving that human connection. We have been in front of a phone and, and like part of this digital transformation since we were literally born. And, you know, so they're actually going back to old school, like meeting people at gyms and, and happy hours after work. Amazing. And so I found that trend to be so powerful and poignant into what we're talking about right now. Like, you know, there's there's some shiny new toys that can come on the horizon and it's a fast paced, interesting world we're in right now. But at the end of the day, like we're social creatures, you know, and we crave that human connection. Tell me the story, you know, connect with me, you know, understand my pain points. And, and that is really best done, you know, on a, on a more personalized and humanistic level. Yes. Yeah. There's no question that we as humans crave interaction with other humans, right? Yeah. You know, like I talk a lot on my podcast about active marketing. It's, it's it's what we do at Capital Business Development is what we do. We are an active marketing yeah. company. I always I always make the argument that yes, you need passive marketing, but it needs to be like 20% of what you do. The other 80% yeah. needs to be directly reaching out to customers, phone, direct email, doing that legwork that I know that like, so many people are afraid to pick up the phone, right? Like cold calls are scary for a lot of people. And I talk about it, you know, I grew up, I grew up with anxiety of meetings, like meeting anxiety. It's funny, I'm a bit of an introvert, you wouldn't know it, because I've had to change in order to do the job that I that I that I sure. love. But I never started out this way, right? It was repetitive practice, you know, it's making those calls, even though I never wanted to make them, it was just doing those things yeah. over and over and over again, until I got good at them. And mark my words, you can get good at just about anything. And if you're an introvert, and you're like, you're a business owner, and you're thinking, man, I can never pick up that phone and make 20 cold calls. Like, what would I say? Well, that's it. You don't know necessarily what you'll say, but your pitch will get better and better and better each time. And the better you get at the thing that you suck at, Oh, the better for your business, because the thing that, that that's holding you back right now, or the thing that you're reluctant to do is like 99% of the time, the thing that would grow your business the most. <laughs> That is true. And you get more comfortable, right? Yeah. Like you just have to get like, once you gain your confidence, then, you know, you're like, and Hey, I did a hard thing. I did something that's outside of my comfort zone a little bit and it was successful. And that's how you boost your confidence too. So, so yeah, no, I totally, I totally get it. And as a fellow introvert who, who, you know, you have to turn it on yeah. <laughs> in the BDS world, but yeah, it's, I, I understand it completely for sure. I wonder what the statistic is, Esther, of like how many of us business development people are actually introverted people. 
I would love to run that data for sure. <laughs> I would love it. I, I <laughs> bet have, you it's a lot more than you would think. We get accused every day of being like the extroverts of the universe. Yeah. And then and then people like us that are like, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> I have to yeah. have my battery recharge time too. Yeah, it's so funny. You know, like I went to school for business admin as well. And when I got out, like in my mind, I never thought about, <laughs> it sounds kind of funny. I... I went to school for business admin to get out of sales. Like in my mind, that's what I was thinking. It's like, oh, well, yeah. if I get out of business admin, I can go to operations. I can go to like, you know, I can become an executive level in a company and we can like figure things out that way. What I never recognized was it doesn't matter what you do. You're in sales. Like it doesn't matter like what position you have in a company. The reality is it is your responsibility. I always say it's the responsibility of everybody in a company to market the company, especially if you're client facing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I think that there's like, there needs to be a little bit more focus on companies to, to involve everybody and to say, you know, like, even if you're in the field, and you're doing that day to day work, if you're having client interaction, you are representing the company. And so on some level, Absolutely. it is your job to sell for your company, like, it really is the responsibility of everybody in an organization to to move that yeah. company forward. Yeah, I totally agree. And and I think going back to what you said earlier, like the business development people, you know, they're the ones that are on the ground wearing the brand, you know, they breathe personality into the brand. And so it's it's a key, crucial and fun role to be so because you define who the brand is, right? And that's, there's a lot of pressure, but also a lot of freedom and fun. Yeah, absolutely. I know that like, you know, you're you do a lot of creative marketing kind of things. I love your newsletter, by the way, Esther sends an amazing newsletter to all Fleur employees every week. And it's always yeah. full of pertinent, great information. It's always got a lot of character. I, I think you're doing a great job with that. Keep it up. It's amazing. Um, and it really yeah. is you. It's something that, that I feel like the whole company looks forward to seeing, whether you're on the Canadian side or the US side or anywhere else. I, I think we're always looking for Esther's newsletter to see what's new and, and, and hot and what's, what are the hot topics for the week. It's great. Congratulations on that. I think it's very Thanks. well done. Tell me a little bit about your process like I know I, I you know I've met you obviously through our business development chats through Fleur Driver yeah. but can you yeah. maybe tell me a little bit about what your day-to-day -day looks like at Fleur? Oh so Fleur is a big dynamic exciting time right now because you know as you know Kelly like there's you know, the, the big floor e-brand, which everybody knows and loves, there's not a lot of companies that can do what Floor does on the scale that it does, right? But as part of that portfolio, Floor has a lot of different business units that are within the bigger brand as well. And so where the real excited for me, where the exciting piece is, is like, how do you build these into the big story of Floor? And how do you make them harmonize with the big, you know, the big floor brand and, and make sure that we're all on the same path together? Because there's different messages for different business units that are around floor. And so where the creative part gets exciting is because, you know, this business unit, it has... It it operates in its own little animal in a certain way, right? We have a different customer landscape. For example, my team, we have a different competitive landscape. And so how do we make, you know, our message and our story, you know, resonate in, in the marketplace that's in a little bit of a different marketplace than the rest of like Papa Floor or Big Floor or whatever. So it's exciting because we're all part of one story. We're all one team. We're all one, one unit, one brand, right? But there's just different little personality elements that make up that big brand in the portfolio like, like Floor. So yeah. But anyway, it's a, it's a fun time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, t I totally understand that. I'd never worked at an organization the size of Fleur before I got in with Fleur Driver. So for me, it was a big learning experience as well as to like, how do you navigate that in business development, where you're trying to, you're trying to build excitement, you're trying to really promote yeah. great things, because let's get real, Fleur does amazing things. And doesn't matter what branch of Fleur you are in. It's an amazing company. It's an amazing organization. Really I would argue it's probably really. one of the, it, if not the biggest in the world, it is the second biggest. And yeah. like you said, there's so many, there's so many things going on in Fleur at any given time. What I always found being a little different working for an organization of that size was essentially having to get approvals for things. You know, it's not the same as a small company where you can just be like, oh, I'm going to try this today and it's going to be great. It's like, no, there's a there's a visual identity to Fleur. There's certain ways yeah. that you have to do things because an yeah. organization of that size, the brand is critically important. So can you speak a little bit to brand and 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 how maybe companies or what smaller companies that maybe aren't thinking about the brand should do? 
So, well, floor is an interesting. So, the governance is is absolutely interesting, and it goes into it's a it's a vibrant conversation right now with all of the marketing and communications people with the corporate team, right? Like, like what is this brand in this fast changing environment? Like, how do we handle all of the different business units? Like, how do we grow and, and have like a five year, ten year forward thinking, you know, brand mentality? And so, there's things that are changing. There's recognition that like, hey, we have to modify things. We have to be a little bit more agile. Um, I think when you get into these really big organizations, agility can be tough because, you know, of the governments and there's a tendency to just rest on what has always worked. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the soft, warm comfort zone of an organization. And this is where people, you know, well, this was successful, you know, in in the nineties. And it's like, yeah, but this is, you know, 30 years later. And so, so there's a lot of internal education. Yeah. Yeah. that happens even within our colleagues like you know hey and 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 again the fun thing about marketing and business development for the most part is there's no prescription, right? Nope. There's no Bible for what, what absolutely works. Yeah. And so, so it's just an interchange of like creative ideas and like, can we just move it a little bit, you know, further this way? And can we open, you know, these doors a little bit by, you know, changing our, changing our tone, changing our voice, changing our vernacular, you know, entering, you know, connecting with this particular target market. That's a little bit outside of this target market. And how do we do that? And like new collection of buyer personas and, and stuff like that. And so it's, it, it's, it's how you choose to look at it but it's a it, this is a very exciting time for a lot of these huge big corporations yes and so for small businesses and entrepreneurs like man consider yourself lucky that you have <laughs> the agility and the freedom to to not be in that place exactly so yeah absolutely absolutely like there is advantages to being small don't yeah. don't think that because you're a smaller and newer business or you know maybe you're a medium-sized organization with say like 50 employees something like that you can still maneuver very quickly. If things need to change or you yeah. need to implement or adopt new processes, that can happen very, very fast in your organization, which becomes much harder when you're dealing with a company with 40,000 employees, right? Sure. It's, a, sure. It's, a, sure. it's a completely different monster and a lot more a lot more thought has to go into something like that. And, and you know, Esther kind of yeah. hit the nail on the head. There's government regulations. Big companies like that get scrutinized. That just is what it is. Yeah. And there's a lot more sure. thought that has to go into anything done in an organization like that, which, you know, congratulations, Esther, you do an amazing job at what you do. And you're having to navigate a very challenging thing that most business development people do never, never get the opportunity to even see. So, you know, congratulations on your success. Congratulations on what you do for Fleur, because it is much needed and you do a great job at it. Well, kind words, thanks. But, yeah. <laughs> well, I see what you do. Yeah, you, you do a great job. I guess one of the things that I wanted to touch on with you was in your time doing doing business development for Michelin and now for Fleur, you know, it's an ever evolving landscape, which is kind of something that you touched on. But maybe are there a few things that you've noticed that no matter where you go, they allow you to, you know, to build brand recognition, to make connections with new customers. Are there some like staple things that maybe you can speak to for, for new business development people or, or business development uh, or business owners that might find very valuable that sort of no matter where you've been, you've always found that you can you can work with them and you can use them to grow the business? So I guess my personal pillars that I rest on every day is just the, sort of the mentality of content is king, right? Like, like really be trying to create content and however you choose to define it, whether it's like, you know, your social media posts, your brochures and one pagers, you know, I'm currently in a business to business role right now. So, so my content is a little bit different than some of like the bigger brands, you know, B2C content creations, but, but regardless of, of, where you stand in the in the BDS landscape, you know, you have a customer and you have a consumer and they have pain points. And so understanding the voice of the customer, that's always one that I go back to, you know, buyer personas, know who you're talking about, what what are they doing, where where are they getting consuming their media? You know, because we have the data analytics. I'm such a nerd and such a geek. And so I love marketing research and you know pulling data and then analyzing it and then creating an action from it and an execution action from it. But, but yeah, content is king, you know, know who your target audience is like, take some time to do a little bit of the buyer personas because the great, you know, and, and always 
and approach everything with an element of empathy to a point, you know, like what drives you to action? What drives you to a purchase decision? What influences you, you know, modify that, but also don't be handcuffed to that because, you know, that's still just a very microscopic view of the world. And so you have to get the analytics and the data to really prove, you know, some of your theories on the buyer analytics and the target markets. But at the end of the day, you know, be creative and be fun. Like always think of like new creative fun. And as you said in the introduction, like delight and surprise, because I think at the end of the day, we're all humans. We're all people. Um, and we want to be, you know, respected and we want to be delighted and surprised with, with all of our, our vendors, suppliers and products that we purchase. So. Yeah, no, for sure. You, you, I, I totally get what you're saying. Mind you, you have access to data and analytics that 99% of well, the world does not have And Kelly, to. let me say, I pay for access, okay? And this is one of the perks of being in a large government like organization. I ha- I get to pay for perks like that. So it doesn't just come into my inbox. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. So that is, a different, that is a difference. But so much is available online right now. Yes. You know, like if you can take five, Five to 10 minutes and Google some of these trends, like there's a lot of public information as well as, you know, the McKinsey's and, and, you know, some of the Boston's and stuff like that. But like a lot of it is public information and you can follow, you know, the, the public trends as well. Yes, absolutely. And, and I really love what you said about know, know your audience, right? You know, I talk about this, you know, one brochure does not fit all uses. And I think a lot Never. of companies have it in their mind, like, oh yeah, we'll build this great brochure. But you have to keep in mind that, you know what I mean? I get it. Like in this case, you guys are hearing us talk about a a gigantic corporation that works across multiple industries. But, you know, you have to think that way because your product or service is probably also usable across multiple industries. And if you only have a, in in the case of what Esther was talking about, as far as like a cut sheet, what she's talking about by cut sheet, it's it's a term we use in Fleur. So I'm going to (laughs) just, I'm going to explain it a little bit. It's a one pager. It's essentially a one pager brochure that you put inside of a, of a greater brochure, right? A more, a more overlapping brochure. But what that, what that cut sheet or one pager is for is we build them for specific industry. So, you know, in the case of whether we're working in manufacturing today, or we're talking to oil and gas, or we're talking to some other industry, we have specific one pagers as to why you should use Fleur. What, like why we're, you know, why we are a leader in that space. And you need to be thinking yeah. about it from that standpoint as well, because when you're marketing your company, the reality is you are likely a leader in your space, but it's not going to matter if you're marketing to forestry using an oil and gas cut sheet, right? <laughs> right. Right. Well, and this is where empathy comes in, right? Like as you, when you're, you know, when you get a, a you know, cut sheet or whatever you want to call it, any sort of marketing information, like, do you respond when it's cut, copy, paste across the board? Or do you respond when it's so much more personalized to exactly what your day to day is? You know, obviously like we're selfish, narcissistic human beings and we want our suppliers and our customers to know us very well. And so, yeah, talk to me in relative terms, (laughs) produce content that's relative to me and not just like cut, copy, paste across the board to everybody. Yeah, no, you hit the nail on that ahead I don't oh man if I if I get an email or something like that and I know that it's just a cut copy paste Esther I don't even know if I can read it it drives me that crazy (laughs) especially being in business development and just like knowing that level of personal connection that I want to establish with the people I'm marketing to when someone does that to me I don't know about you but I like 90% of the time unless I can really see some value in it real quick I, I don't even read it yeah Yeah, yeah. This is this is where the changing consumer, you know, is really relevant, I think, nowadays. And and just gone are the days when you can, you know, just make blanket statements like everybody expects a level of customization and personalization now. And of course, it takes intent and it takes time and effort. But I just think it's so much more worth it. And it goes back to the human connection piece that we were just talking about. You know, if you can take a little bit of time and, you know, do some research, personalize your communications with these guys before you just pick up the phone and say, like, hey, buy this from me you know like where did they go to school like what are they doing in their day-to-day you know how can you really help like what do you understand to be pain points of this general industry you know that your our service solves and and you know talk to them on on those types of of really relevant terms yeah no absolutely when the more you can personalize any message and i don't care whether this is you reaching out making your initial linkedin digital introductions or whether this is you sending a formal email 
the more that you can personalize it, the better your response rate is going to be first off. You know, the reality oh, is yeah. it's like, if you have to put in time, I think this is the critical thing is that people don't think about their time. But your time yeah. is the most valuable asset you have. And I don't care whether you're an employee at an organization or you're a business owner, entrepreneur, you only have so many hours in a day. And regardless of what you're doing, you are paid to be effective, right, Esther? Like at the end of the day, yeah. Yeah. in business development, if we go into business development and we're not effective, we're not in business development very long, are we? Right, right, <laughs> right. right. And, and right. it doesn't matter. And if you're a business owner and you're not effective at your marketing, you're not in business very long. So you only have, let's say, 8, 10, 12 hours a day, every day yeah. to do something great. And if you're going to send, let's say, 50 digital introductions, you know, if they're just this cut, copy, paste, they're not specialized, they're not industry specific, you're not putting any thought into them and you send those 50 out and you only get one response versus let's say that you did 25 really highly cr well-crafted emails, thought through, industry targeted, targeted to your target audience and you get 10 responses back, which one was more valuable? The reality is they both exactly. took the same amount of time, right? Exactly. But you have to think about if they're going to take the same amount of time, which one is going to be the most valuable for your business? And that's one of the things that if you're in business development, entrepreneurship, you need to be thinking about that. How do you connect? And that's something, Esther, that you know, you're really great at. You've been working with large organizations for a long time. You've really thought it through. You've figured out what works. It's, this, it's podcasts like this. It's, it's talks like this that we get to chat about things that will truly help other businesses. And that's why I'm really happy to have you on today as another business development expert, because we don't get too many of them on this show and especially not at your caliber. And so, yeah, it, I definitely, I definitely resonate with the connection that you're talking about. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about it for sure. <laughs> I think that, I think that most good business development people are, we, we've recognized, I think, especially, you know, when you've been in the industry, as long as we have, we've recognized that the personal connection is almost more important than the pitch itself most of the time. Ironically, you know, I have companies always, always reach out to me and they say, you know, we have this really, really great pitch. It's like incredibly compelling. But if you can't, if you can't personalize, if you can't make a connection where, you know, yeah. your customer likes talking to you or, or you, you leave a great impression, whether you're leaving a voicemail or whether you're, you're leaving a great, well, well-crafted email, right? If you're not able to, put a little bit of yourself into that, have that human connection. It's really hard to sell the rest. It is. It is. And back to your point, like when you are the face of business development and sales, you are the brand, like you are your yes. brand and you are the brand of the company. And so you define the personality, you define the connection, you define the problem solving that, you know, you're going to bring forward to the customer. Yeah, for sure. Can you speak to that a little bit, Esther? How, like, how, how do you develop your personal brand? If you're, if you're a business development person or you're an entrepreneur kind of launching a new company, what are some of the things that you would recommend to them with, with regards to developing their brand or their brand, sorry, and becoming more recognizable? Okay. Can we play a little game Absolutely. on this topic? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So I'm going to tell you a brand and you tell me the first thing that comes into your head when I, when I mention this brand. Okay. Okay. Patagonia. Uh, like jackets. Okay. Nike. Shoes. Lego. Toys. Tesla. Cars. Okay. So when you are the brand, what is the one thing that you want your customers to think of once you identify and introduce yourself, make that first connection so that when they see your name, that the first thing that comes to their brain, like of assimilation is that is how you define your brand and how you do well. So like for me, I would have probably said Patagonia, all about environment, nature, you know, <laughs> Nike is all about just do it, exertion, yeah. like go a little bit further, you know, Lego is all about ex, you know, like children, exploration, games, gamifying, yeah. like making everything fun in a game. Tesla is all about like innovation, like strict innovation. And so that's, 
like think of the brands that you that attract you yeah. right like what are the elements what are the personalities of these brands that like that really bring you to them and then as you enter the marketplace both as you Kelly yeah. and as you you know representing you know your your client then you know what is the word and the and the immediate things that you want people to to stick with once they leave the conversation so i encourage that because it's all about repetition right like it takes a ton of repetition for and and lots of exposure for like these mental images to come as soon as you see that brand or hear that brand and so it's it's a repetition it's like a consistent delight and surprise you know it is but but that's to me what what really plays the power of the brand for sure first off i feel like i failed the test <laughs> you didn't fail the test there's no pass there's no i'm pass such a fail. consumer of these items clearly <laughs> i know i know what there's i would no buy from fail. them and why <laughs> yeah. there's no pass or fail um, but, it, but it, it makes you think because again as business development and sales and like going back to you are your brand like think of the brands that you consume and think of the brands that you admire yeah. or that you don't like and you just don't know why you don't like them whether it's like public image or whatever but like sure. take note of those things and make sure that like again implore empathy and be like you know what do i want to be to my customers what do i want to be to my clients and then how can i represent myself as such you so. know yeah you really hit on something that i want to touch to especially regarding brand and brand recognition and that's like you know you talked about think about the brands that you know, have a negative association with them. And then yeah. how critical it is to protect your brand, which is something that I think Fleur does very, very well, right? Like they have they, they have their own rules do. about how we how we talk about Fleur, yep. and how we how we show Fleur to the world. You know, you talked about some of the ways that companies can start to think about how to create their brand and establish it and establish a connection between your products and say your brand name itself. What are some of the ways that they can protect their image, Esther? What are some of the ways that a company can work to protect its brand reputation? So we'll get a little bit edgy if you don't mind. Sure, things. absolutely. So because now it has never been more difficult for a brand to protect its reputation because, because the environment is commanding and demanding responses from different companies on a political level, like never before. Right. And so, so you can either go the risk averse route or you can go, you know, the, you have, <laughs> you can, you can join the sides and be, you know, energetic for a cause, but in previous, like even five years ago, this was never really an issue. No. And so when it comes to brand protection, you really do need to understand where your brand fits and where you guys fit. And it goes back into personality because now again, more than ever, even more than five years ago, brands have personalities. And so, and they are being forced through, you know, social federal implications to kind of like define themselves on different spectrums. I personally think that it's, it's tough, right? Because you're going to lose some people and you're going to gain some people. And so you have to understand what is the price of, of the wallet that you're trying to you know, target. And, and it's, it's tricky. I really don't have necessarily a secret sauce for this and what's going on right now as far as brand protection, but be true to yourself, you know, like understand who you are as a person, understand who your brand is. You know, if, if you have a lot of people, you, you probably need to define where there needs to be group consensus on where do we sit <laughs> on a couple of the different, you know, changes that are, that are going to be pushed onto us because your customers will demand a response. You know, the, just the social network is going to demand a response. And so like, what, what is, you know, are you going to avoid it and just, you know, play Switzerland? Are you going to choose a side? But, you know, it's never been like this before. Nobody really knows how to play this playing field because never before in brand history has this been a thing yeah. like it is now. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally with you. And, and I think like the takeaway that I want my listeners to get from this today is that understand, you know, Esther works for one of the largest corporations in the world, and they are struggling with how do we play ball in this new landscape. So like, keep in mind yeah. that if you're a smaller company, or you know, you're a business development person or a marketer trying to think of like, you know, what do we get behind? What don't we get behind? How do we do this? Understand you're not alone. Like everybody is trying to figure out how to do this because you know the reality is and I, you know i hate to sound i hate to sound like like i don't care about anything because i do i care about a lot of things but i think as a business you know we didn't go into business to care about different things for the most part we went into business because there was something that we were great at 
And we right. knew that the world needed it. And I think at the end of the day, it's important to keep remembering why you went into business, even with all of these crazy things and like the world being such a wild place and our access to information and the way things are changing all the time. It's easy to get caught up in this like polarized place, right? Like that is just the world we live in. I don't care whether you're in Canada, United States, our, yeah. our countries are polarized like they've never been polarized, polarized before. I've never seen Canada like this. I'm sure you've never seen the United States at the level you are, Esther. Right. And right. remember why you got into business. I think that that's really, really critical as any company so important. Is, yeah. is, you know, before you start to make all of these claims or what you're going to get behind or whatever else, think about, was that something that you would have even thought about when you first got into your business? And is it really that critical to have a side? Yeah. Yeah. I also going back to our conversation about authenticity, right? I think it's okay right now to, to talk about it with your clients too. Like, you know, I am getting this pressure. I'm not really sure how, you know, why I as a business owner of this particular product or service need to like take a stand. And, you know, and you can kind of declare a little bit your <laughs> confusion is and and you know, frustration with the with the general marketplace in this regard. And I think that you'll find a lot of empathy as well, because people are also like, yeah, we don't know which way is up either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, for sure. I, it's so funny, like even in the Kennedy household, you know, me, me and my fiance have chats about about stuff like this regularly. And it's yeah, it's really hard. It's really yeah. hard on all levels. Like you don't, you don't think about how challenging some of these political issues are to deal with. And, you know, we don't get into politics much on the show. This is just not a place that once again, it's yeah, not, yeah. it's not important to the business it development matter, world. Yeah. Right. It's so, not important. So we don't really talk about it much, but like, do you understand that? Like, I understand that in all of your households, these things are, you know, they're becoming talking point issues. They're becoming yeah. hard conversations, even between, you know, even between you, you, your family. Right. So yeah, Understand that if as a business you're struggling, we all get it. We're all struggling. Yeah. No matter what size yeah. the business, we're all struggling with yeah. how to how to approach these issues. And I think it's okay, my personal opinion, right? Like it's this is Esther's opinion, but like it's okay to just recognize like I don't know yeah. <laughs> how to be a business owner in, in this landscape right now. And because I definitely don't want to hurt any people. I don't want to drive away, you know, customers based on something that is absolutely yeah. not part of my business model. Yeah, <laughs> or, or it, has it just zero yeah. zero to do with your business or your product or service, right? right? I think that that's right, the right. flip side of it is that, you know, you have to think about does it does it have any impact on you on what you do? Right? I yeah. think that that's definitely a critical a critical point. And I and I kind of feel like maybe if it doesn't have any impact on what you do, maybe you are Switzerland, maybe, yeah. maybe you don't have to have a side, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> not, not everything yeah. is worth not everything is worth fighting for. I think that that's another right. really sick. You don't have to take a stand that is outside of your business model. And so you know, traversing that landscape can be, you know, challenging right now but but I feel like things things have to calm down you know and so just kind of ride the tumultion a little bit and, and it will calm down but you know stick to your guns with Switzerland <laughs> yeah for sure for sure I want to take us back to back to marketing <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. If, if we in in marketing do you see like what are some of the changes or upcoming trends that you're noticing Esther that maybe you didn't see a year ago obviously AI is yeah. a huge one but what are Man. what are some of the other things that you're noticing that that might benefit businesses moving forward if they start looking into it? Well, so AI absolutely and just chat you and all of all of the things that are coming in that is fascinating and and don't listen to anybody nobody knows what's going on no. with this. <laughs> like so just keep your eye out. I encourage everybody to keep themselves educated, pay attention to it, but you know, don't like the sky is not falling necessarily because of some of these things like it has been, you know, you've seen imprinted with some of the marketing stuff around chat and, and just overall AI, but AI is interesting. And again, I feel like it's a, it's a, it could be a great tool. We all are in the same boat where you have to learn how to use it. So everybody, the exciting part is that for the most part, everybody's in the same starting point, yeah. which yes. is kind of rare for marketing trends. Usually there's, there's some that are ahead than others, but I feel like we're all kind of in this, in the starting point together. And then the other one, and is sustainability. I think that that is, is super interesting on an international playing field because 
what, you know, what is your responsibility as a brand to leave to the next generation? And so, and again, it, it has been somewhat politicized and I wish it, we could take it out of that political spectrum, but like, you know, I do think that sustainability, your community involvement, you know, what are you doing to make the world a better place, either through your business or, you know, as a human, as in part of your business, like, you know, definitely a little bit of community sustainability is, is also a key and because people want to see what you're doing with your brand, your power, your message to make the world a better place. Yes. And I think a lot of companies, you know, especially when, when they're starting out and kind of building their, their place, that's not really on their mind, at least not initially. But I think all companies get to a place where it's like, okay, you know what, like, a lot has a lot of great things, people have done a lot of great things for us. How do we give back to the community, right? You know, yeah. like obviously with the business development podcast, it, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a double edged sword. Like on the one hand, yeah, I can I can showcase my expertise in business development, I can help other businesses, and I can in some levels advertise for capital business development, which is my company. But I also recognize the value of the show and, and the point of the show really at the end of the day, you know, the takeaways that you get from each of these episodes will help you grow your business, it'll help you make better choices, it'll help you make choices that you know, me and Esther had to figure out the hard way, right? Exactly. <laughs> right? Like, painful, painful ways, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Like the reality is it's like, unfortunately, in my life, I've had to learn things the hard way 99% of the time. So if I can save even yeah. one person a headache from this show, it is all worthwhile. And, you know, we get to have yeah. these amazing interviews. One of the great things about the Business Development Podcast is that I get such amazing guests, you know, guests like yourself, Esther, incredibly accomplished, working for a gigantic corporation to be able to provide the level of information that most people just could not get. That's just the truth. Most people could not get the level of information that they get from these interviews without frankly working for an organization like Fleur, right? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And so, yeah, I really, I really love giving back. And this is one of the ways that I can give back. But I do think it's important that all companies look at how they're doing that. Because at some level, it is important to give back to the community that helped you. Well, it is. And then understand also where that fits into the crawl, walk, run, right? Like definitely have your crawl, walk, run outlined, like get on your feet, you know, build your brand, get comfortable, get a good stride and then figure out, you know, your giving back policy is, is kind of my recommendation. But, but, you know, it definitely, people are starting to look at it from a, just an overall consumer trends, you know, like back to like, you know, never before have, have people been, you know, forced to, to take a stand, but they're also, you know, the, the audience, the Gen Z specifically, are looking for what are you doing to contribute to bettering the world or bettering your community and and so it's a good reminder for all of us to just be a good human yes. right? and be good and, and kind and this is to your point this is a contribution like this is a great you know resource and education tool for so so many people and you know encourage you know others and some of your listeners and some of your you know fellow fan club to to take you know think outside the box and and along these levels and how you can impact them yeah like other people like what can you do to really impact and and to make a difference and to to cause benefit and good change in the world well, you know, I talk about it on the show a lot, Esther, where, you know, like me and you, we're business development and marketing experts. We've been doing this an incredibly long time. However, we were really only experts until yesterday, right? Like the world <laughs> is changing so much that to just stick our head in the sand and say that we know everything and we know exactly how it needs to be done, we would fall behind. We would quickly not become experts because what oh, really yeah. makes you an expert is the ability to be a lifelong learner. It's the ability to yeah. recognize that you don't have all the answers, but you're willing to find them out. And it's like humility, man. Absolutely. Right? You ha humility makes you an expert. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Because you know, it's like what worked for me right up to yesterday is amazing. Like, you know, I love yeah. the skills that I've learned in business development. I think a lot of them are universal and continue no matter where we go. But like you said, you know, you have to be ear to the ground. You have to see what's coming up. What are the trends changing? What are, what are the positions I'm going to take on certain things? Or you know, with AI, how the heck do we use it? Because like you said, no matter the size of the organization right now, nobody really knows how to use it. And it's a conversation right. we have on pretty much every episode, because it's so game changing yeah. right now for everything. Sure. But, you know, recognize that that like Esther said, you know, the, the playing field right now on that side of things is level, but make sure that you're not just implementing AI to have shiny things. You know, I had, a, I had a conversation with Joel McGalnick and he was really talking about like, don't just implement things to implement things. It's like, don't, don't right. just have the shiny new toy if it does no benefit to you. You have to look at everything that you implement for your business. And remember, like take it back to what I was talking about before is you only have so much time. You only have eight to 12 hours a day to do your job, right? Make sure that if you're implementing AI, 
it is genuinely saving you time. It is genuinely doing things that take things off your plate because to implement AI or different technology just to do it is silly. You need to have purpose behind it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious to see how the marketplace is going to react because it goes back to the personalization, you know, like, and of course, as AI develops, like it will start to take on a little bit more of that humanistic vernacular, yeah. but you know, it, it's definitely not as personalized and, is, and, and it definitely lacks that human connection that we were talking about earlier. Totally, totally. What I've found, you know, we, caution, we yeah. used chat at capital, you know, sure. I've used it. I've used it to help me craft emails or different things. However, I do not use it and then just say, yep, this is perfect. We're firing this out. I change an absolute ton of it. I think it's really great to organize a great pitch or to organize uh, and communicate something in a way very well. However, AI embellishes pretty much everything. So I find that like a lot of the, the verbs or like action words that it uses, I have to kind of go in and be like, yeah, that's a bit much. I'm going to tone that back. Is this something that Kelly would say? I think Maybe that's a question you need to ask yourself when you're going to write an email or when you're going to create a post. Just say like, look, is this me? Is this something that I would say? And if that answer is no, make enough changes until it is something that sounds like you. Totally agree. And and going back to like, you know, use the free resources to to do some research and anal analytics on, on a lot of like whatever topics. Chat and AI, open AI is a great research tool, but fact check. <laughs> so so yes. absolutely fact check. Don't <laughs> take it as a gospel truth when it, you know, types out the response. You so. know what's kind of funny, Esther? I, I watched a video and they were talking about how when AI makes things up like that, how it'll just like create yeah. its own references and stuff they actually don't know why it's doing that which is a little bit sources. terrifying they will cite like legal documents <laughs> that are just They'll make completely them up. not true yeah. and so it's it's wild like it can sound so convincing but yeah it's really it's so interesting it's an interesting time it, it's an interesting time right now yeah sure. it really is and you know like we could get into the the philosophical things behind AI all day long. But one of the scary things yeah. about that, you know, is that they don't know why it's doing that. Why is it making up like, is it just I have to create an answer? And so it's it's making like, I feel like that that definitely gets into the Terminator level of things where it's like, oh, maybe we need to like, we need to take a step back until we figure out why these things are doing what they're doing. <laughs> It's, it's a beast, man. Can we tame it? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think what's what's amazing and you know what I talk about on the show is that we're basically at iPhone one, right? We're at iPhone yeah. one in AI and the stuff that it's doing already is unbelievable. You know, some I would say some of the time savings just in, in the podcast itself, helping me do summaries, helping me do my transcriptions for the show, like the time savings alone is next level. Like the, the AI yeah. has probably saved me four to five hours of time savings for every episode. However, yeah, it's like, and it's only going to get better and better, I guess, over time. But I guess what I'm getting at is it's like, you, you need to see, is it actually saving you the time? I think that's, that's one of the takeaways I kind of want to get from this episode is that implementing new things is great, especially in the marketing world. We have to be ahead. We have to be ahead, right? When you work for a company, when you work for a large corporation, or whether you work for a small company, you have to be innovative, you can't get stuck in your ways, and you have to be forward thinking. But just make sure that, you know, technology is changing quickly, make sure that whatever technology you guys are implementing really has true benefit to your business. Because unless it's saving you a, a lot of time, or it's creating a product that is is amazing compared to maybe what you were doing before, you have to ask yourself, is the cost worth it? And I get right now, you know, that cost might not be high, but over time, you know, those costs add up. So you have to look at everything you're implementing and ask yourself, what value does this drive for my business? The, the core of economic principles, right, is the opportunity worth the cost. And it, I'll reflect back to what we were saying when it's like, you are your brand, you know, make sure that AI is not your brand. <laughs> make sure that you keep the you in your brand and don't, you know, you know, just keep it in balance and check right now. So absolutely. That's all. Absolutely. Esther, it's been an absolutely amazing episode. I've had a great conversation with you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I have been thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Kelly. Yeah, it's so great. It's so great to have another marketing expert to kind of bounce these things off of. It's, it's a great conversation. Do you have any questions for me before we wrap up today's episode? I don't. I just want to work more with you. So when are you going to come to the U.S. and hang out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're we're doing things over in Canada. So when they let me, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> 
sounds great. That sounds great. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure having you on this episode, Esther, especially such a key point episode, episode 40. Very cool. Very cool yeah. conversation. Congratulations. Thank Happy you. 40th, Kelly. Truly, truly. <laughs> yeah. a great... Hopefully it'll be my 60th soon. <laughs> exactly. It's coming up. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Well, this has been episode 40 of the Business Development Podcast. We have had an amazing amazing conversation with Esther Hall, who is a marketing expert with Fleur Corporation. Esther, thank you for coming on the show. Until next time, we will catch you on the flip side. This has been the Business Development Podcast with Kelly Kennedy. Kelly has 15 years in sales and business development experience within the Alberta oil and gas industry and founded his own business development firm in 2020. His passion and his specialization is in customer relationship generation and business development. The show is brought to you by Capital Business Development, your business development specialists. For more, we invite you to the website at www.capital. See you next time on the Business Development Podcast.